coming months. Uh, we've already had a couple of those presentations, which have been wonderful so far. Uh, today, I wanted to introduce our speaker, uh, John Crawford, and he's professor of Intermedia Arts at UCI, and he teaches here in the dance department and directs the Embodied Media Research Group. So he's an intermedia artist, also a performance director and systems designer who's been active in this field since the early 1990s. And he creates performances as well as immersive environments and experiences through embodied interaction and engages directly with transformational technologies to create these works. His projects are performed in theaters, exhibited in galleries and presented as immersive installations that feature the creative exploration of environmentalism, climate justice, and community engagement. His work investigates how the human desire to transform our environment is unleashing destructive forces that endanger the world and everything in it, including ourselves. So it's pretty heavy stuff sometimes. He has served as Associate Dean in UCI's Claire Trevor School of the Arts and in other uh, campus leadership roles. He's the co-founder of Eco Art Lab and Eco Design Lab, which are two nonprofits that employ art and design to respond to the escalating environmental crisis. His work has been shown across North America and in Asia, Europe, and South America. And he's a frequent visiting artist and researcher at universities and other venues throughout the United States, Europe, China, Japan, and India. So we're very grateful to have him here with us today uh, to discuss his embodied media uh, research and uh, happy to present John Crawford. Thank you kindly, Steve. And thank you all for being here on this beautiful Friday afternoon. Uh, it's so nice to see you all. And um, you know, I wanna say what a great honor it is to be one of the inaugural crop of uh, Newkirk fel faculty fellows. Um, it, it's, um, it's really important that we find ways on this campus and in other places as well to work across the disciplinary boundaries that sometimes kind of put, the, put us into silos or, or boxes that really are not about the advancement of knowledge or creativity or human interaction, but really are kind of about, well, administrative convenience. Oh, they're in that department. Oh, they're in this department. And um, one of the things that in this short time of, of working with my fellow fellows, um, I have been able to experience is there's a really great camaraderie and feeling of cooperation. Not so much that at this point we've identified a number of specific projects or grants that we want to apply to together, but really more that we can kind of share our concerns or our ideas, our thoughts, and get feedback from others who, um, Steve didn't mention it, but the fellows represent a very broad cross-section of the campus, a very broad cross-section of people who are relatively new to UCI, people who have been here for a while, people who have long publication records, people who are just getting started. So, you know, it's really, it really feels like a, a great environment and a microcosm of the kind of university I want to be a part of, a transdisciplinary, open-minded, supportive environment. So thank you so much to Steve and to the Newkirk Center for making all this possible. Okay, so I'm here to talk to you um, for, for a brief while, but I would also like to engage in a conversation. And maybe the easiest way to do that would be, perhaps I'll you know chat for half an hour or so and put out a few ideas. If you have thoughts, I, ideas, questions, concerns, as I'm going through all this, try to make a, a, a mental note or write it on the tablecloth or something, and then we can get back to your questions and, and any kind of interactive discussion that might be able to happen um, after that. So um, let's talk a bit about what it means to um, make this kind of art in a collaborative environment. First, before I do that, though, I want to introduce um, two of my wonderful colleagues who are here, Lisa Noggle, who's a professor in the dance department with me, and uh, Lisa, wave please, there she is, and Ivan Williams, uh, back table there, who's uh, not a faculty member here, but is um, a producer, and you can wait until you see what they've done to applaud, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you will, maybe you won't, uh, uh, but uh, uh, Ivan and Lisa are um, important collaborators of mine because they bring in 
areas of expertise that I don't have, networks that I don't have, and also um, ability to collaborate in a broad range of disciplines and practices. I am in the dance department because at UCI you have to be in a department, uh, but I'm not a dancer. I'm an intermediate artist, which means you, that wasn't obvious that I'm not an answer. Uh, uh, I, I'm an intermediate artist, which means to me that I work at the intersection of multiple art forms and practices. Uh, so I do a lot of work with video, computers, uh, maybe you know uh, a fair bit with various kinds of visual art. Um, Lisa is a choreographer and uh, Ivan is a film producer among other things. So we work together in ways that support one another and support each other's practices. Also, we work very closely with other faculty in the School of the Arts and other students. I'm gonna show you a couple of projects in a minute, one of which was made by, uh, I think a total of about 80 of us. I was the director, but we brought in multiple faculty, multiple students, another one that was about 50 of us. So. It is a collaborative collective activity. Uh, and as you can see from the slide here, trying to create a way of bridging disciplinary boundaries within the arts, because surprisingly, are there are some people who feel more comfortable identifying as, okay, I am a musician and that's the only thing I do. But people find, especially if they're in the School of the Arts at UCI as students or faculty, that bridging, working across boundaries learning new things, learning disciplinary ways of approaching things and bringing their own disciplinary practices to that can be really helpful. I formed the Embodied Media Research Group in collaboration with Lisa and Ivan because we wanted to make a particular kind of art. We wanted to make art that is socially engaged. And as it says here, we want to work in collaboration with a range of communities and we wanna make art that grapples with the concerns that many of us feel on a day-to-day -day basis. Art for art's sake is wonderful. I've done a lot of it in my career. Art does not have to be about or for anything. Art is, has a, a right to exist in and of itself. But I've just, for the past, I don't know, five or 10 years, really felt a need to engage more deeply with finding ways to Help, help make change happen in the world. Um, and societal change is really what we're talking about here. The way that we can find approaches as artists to make a difference, to grapple with some of these cultural and political issues. And we've decided to focus in on environmental concerns as one of our primary directions. How do we do that? Well, maybe some of you have heard this concept called design thinking. And it was originated in Stanford with a couple of companies in that area. And it, it did really revolutionize the field of technology design. Now, I'm not specifically a technology designer, although I had a career in the software industry. What I learned from that career is that people can work together to make large changes happen. Think of all the products and services we have today, all, all the way from the phones we carry around, to the cars we drive, to the rooms we work in, to the content we watch on our screens that really could not have happened without this amazing amount of technological innovation. Design thinking is about applying a structured approach to bringing human, human creativity to bear to create these new products. Now, that's necessary, but not sufficient for the kind of work we want to do. And that's why I'm uh, proposing and uh, advocating this area that I call connected design, which is that in addition to employing the techniques, for those of you who know a bit about design thinking, you'll know it's based on ideation and iteration, some other things, but maybe sometimes it's a little bit missing this notion of empathy and intuition. And so these are the things that I think we can bring to the table as artists. It's really our stock and trade, intuition, empathy, improvisation, finding ways to bring these, uh, these techniques towards developing solutions that are based on people's lived experience and actual needs. Now, I would put in one caveat, I don't think artists are problem solvers. 
artists should be problem creators, or at least the people that identify problems and point out what needs to be done. And others maybe end up solving those problems, but we can participate in that process. So another aspect that we think is important and focus our time on in the Embodied Media Research Group is this notion of emergent technology, which goes back to my days developing 3D and AI software. Um, when I was taking like a 10 year break from being an artist, which turned out to be a big mistake. But luckily, I found ways to then combine my technology practice and my artistic practice, which I've been fortunate enough to be able to do for over 30 years. But what do I mean by emergent technology? Well, um, emergent technologies are the ones that aren't quite ready for prime time yet. You know, an iPhone would not be an emergent technology today. But the devices that are in an iPhone, the gyroscopes and radios and all the other things that are inertial sensors that are all in an iPhone were emerging technologies not that long ago. And so I'm interested in emerging technologies, but more importantly, what we call emergent technologies, which to me is things that are just on the cusp of being ready to deploy in artistic contexts, where as artists, we can see what they do. We can maybe break them and kind of push their boundaries, find out how they are useful to people. And uh, maybe importantly, taking these technologies, using them in media environments that perhaps were not foreseen by the creators. Some of you may know um, Mari Kimura, who's a colleague of ours in the School of the Arts. She has a company making this inertial motion sensor for motion tracking that she decided she needed to invent because she's a violinist. She wanted ways to track the motion of her bow hand when she's not bowing the strings to see if she could change the way the music works from that. So she and her colleagues made a device called Mujik that has a built-in motion sensor, uh, inertial sensor and gyroscope like you have in your phone. But I would venture to guess that whoever invented these inertial sensors and gyroscopes, they, they just kind of put them on a chip now. There's a Bosch chip that they use. Um, whoever invented that chip might not have thought that this was something that would be good for a, violin, a, a violinist, right? Um, so our job as artists engaging with technologies is perhaps to take these devices or techniques or tools in directions that were not foreseen by their creators opening up new pathways, as it says here, for creative thinking. But then maybe that's an iterative loop where we engage with the technology developers and help spark creativity in that direction. So those are the three kind of key pillars of what we're working on in the Embodied Media Research Group. What I'd like to do now is walk you through a couple of projects that we've done together. Um, Lisa and Ivan have been involved in many of these as well, and many of my other colleagues and students in the School of the Arts, because there have been so many different people involved, I can't give them all credit here, unfortunately, but um, you can find their names and all the credits on my website. So let me just get some notes here so I can make sure I don't miss anything. So this project called Living in the Tempest, uh, these photos are from a performance on stage at the Barclay Theater here at UCI. This is um, a project that um, I wanted to address some concerns I had regarding how we perceive our place in the world as people who engage with technology. So this uh, directly follows on what I was mentioning a little bit earlier. Maybe some of you heard that Arthur C. Clarke quote that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, and it's an interesting way to think. And um, I got interested in um, how that might apply in the context of the performing arts, specifically with regard to how William Shakespeare brought in the concepts of magic in his play, The Tempest. And you'll recall that in that play, Prospero was uh, essentially like a magician, um, a, a wizard, shipwrecked on a desert island. He meets up with a couple of spirits in that environment and all kinds of chaos ensues. Well, um, I'm thinking of Prospero as being like our, our technology invention self in all of us. And maybe Ariel and Caliban are the technologies that we invent that come back as you will, for those of you who know The Tempest, there's a lot of unintended consequences involved in Prospero's interactions with Ariel and 
Caliban and others. And so what we wanted to address was this notion of how technology itself can be uh, an enabling force, but it also can be a destructive force. It all depends on how we interact with it. And this idea then of unintended consequences becomes a big part of it. So we engaged very deeply with the Shakespeare text. We came up with some experts, worked with, uh, sorry, some excerpts, and we worked with experts as well who are uh, scholars of Shakespeare in uh, the humanities area and worked with a number of other choreographers, dancers, and musicians to create the piece that you're seeing here. We don't really have time today to go into it in uh, depth, but um, uh, I'll definitely uh, point you towards some online resources that show some of the work we did, if that might be of interest. Um, and this, by the way, here is um, uh, Mari Kimura playing her violin with her music sensor. The little glove on her right hand is actually this sensing device, and she used it to change the score in real time. Uh, that student there was operating one of my software creations. And these students here are operating what we called our performative objects, where Lisa and I, in collaboration with an architecture and, and a materials professor from Rhode Island School of Design, created a whole series of performative objects that responded to different aspects of the student's perceived relationship with the environment. Um, this one, I believe uh, the, uh, there was a mapping between these little kind of white uh, globes and the um, flow of some kind of, a, of an atmospheric flow. I forget exactly what it was, it was a few years ago, but each one of these design students took um, a, an environmentally focused scientific set of data, did some research on that and designed these objects in ways that responded to those thoughts. And we also, I also talked with them a long time about Shakespeare and Prospero and all those things. So it was a really a really interesting kind of collaborative project um, with some wonderful colleagues at Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, the next project I'm going to show you is a bit different in the sense that, you know, if you think of the um, uh, Tempest project, Living in the Tempest, we weren't really kind of engaging specifically with individual environmental concerns. We were more talking in this kind of philosophical way about unintended consequences. Whereas with your ocean, my ocean, we really tried to address specifically some of the concerns related to oceans and coastlines. Um, and maybe another, um, uh, another quote from Arthur C. Clarke, if that might be helpful. He said, how inappropriate to call this planet Earth when it is really clearly mostly ocean. And uh, so I love that. Uh, really, you know, the ocean is super important to me and, and in my own work. And the idea here is that we can start to address some of the concerns that are coming up related to overfishing, acidification, uh, human displacement, other kinds of concerns in an artistic way. Uh, this was a 90 minute performance, so I can't give you the whole story, but obviously these are uh, uh, sea creatures engaging with plastics that end up tangling them up. And in this beautiful ballet choreographed by Molly Lynch, um, they end up having these interactions with these plastic um, uh, containers that end up uh, causing all kinds of unintended consequences. Whoever invented the plastic container did not expect to destroy the oceans, I would assume. So um, these kinds of concerns became really directly a part of the work of the choreographers and dancers who were addressing some of these concepts. Um, this one, uh, the, the um, uh, person you're about to see dressed in black is um, the oil slick. And the um, other two are uh, uh, p humans who are trying to you know, live and, and exist in an environment where, um, as you can see, the background becomes more foreboding. There's a lot of video projection that's part of this whole thing. There's music and, and some amazing dancing. And so the idea here is, again, we're not trying to kind of give a speech about um, ocean acidification or um, uh, pollution, but ocean degradation of various kinds. What we're, we're trying to do is juxtapose, really set up a dialectic between the beauty and the wonderful possibilities in the ocean with 
the potential for huge harm that comes from unthinking engagement with the technologies that we inflict, shall we say, on the ocean environment. So this section here, which was choreographed by Lisa, um, is a way of connecting our feelings about the ocean to our feelings about human displacement and ways that people need to be able to take refuge, whether it's um, you know a, a, a country that is uh, in danger of being eradicated because of sea level rise, whether it's um, forced human migration that relates to climate change, all of these are concerns that we were trying to address in, in, in this dance performance. So by showing you these two projects, um, uh, they, were all, they were both staged here at UCI. The second one that you're seeing here was actually staged in our experimental media performance lab um, in the School of the Arts, um, and then toured to Brown University. We were fortunate enough that they brought us there to uh, uh, restage the project there with some of our students and some of their students. Um, these projects were finished performances for which we sold tickets, but we do a lot of work that is not necessarily finished performances. We really work as much as we can in an experimental way. And so uh, I'm gonna share with you a short excerpt from a project that very few people saw, maybe, I don't know, Lisa, 50, 60 people saw this one. Um, but we staged it primarily as a learning experience for ourselves to develop some of the tools and techniques that were later presented in this other environment. So um, I'm just gonna play this and um, you can listen to the music. I might make one or two comments. So obviously the dancers are engaging with um, these stones that are actually you know, beach stones. The, what's being projected behind them is footage, not only of the stones themselves. You can see that some of it is real-time video that's sensing the dancers in the space. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Some of it is um, sensing the dancers that are in the space and Come on, come back. Some of it is sensing dancers are in the space and some of it is new material that was filmed on location. So um, what I'd like to do next is talk about another project that is uh, in very early stages. We um, haven't presented this anywhere yet. It's really kind of in development. And it's called Change. Subtitle is The Cryosphere Crisis. So the cryosphere, as you probably all know, but forgive me if I'm explaining something that is obvious, the cryosphere is the part of the Earth's surface that is usually covered by ice. So cryosphere includes the glaciers, the um, ice caps uh, at the poles, it in includes the permafrost areas, all of which is threatened by climate change and really in some ways is not only a symptom of, of human uh, caused climate change, but really in some ways the melting of the glaciers, uh, the polar ice caps becomes a cause of other kinds of environmental difficulties. And so this cycle, uh, this crisis that really um, is attributable in, in no uncertain way to human interventions is something that we think that artists can grapple with in various ways. So um, I've been spending a bit of time up in Montana working in Glacier Park where uh, they've done a really amazing job of tracking the changes in the glaciers there. Many glaciers are in inaccessible locations and it can be difficult to know what the changes are unless you're there on a regular basis. They've been photographing the glaciers in Glacier Park uh, from similar locations over and over again, year after year. So we're able to see a really um, obvious uh, uh, um, trend in the, the glacier recession. 
Um, and also, uh, there are groups there that have been really affected by the way that environmental change has not been adequately managed. Um, and I'm referring primarily to the indigenous populations there. Um, in the, uh, the valleys near Glacier Park, uh, the Flathead Valley pri uh, primarily, there are large indigenous groups that actually have a great deal of agency over their lands. There's a, a large park there, a wilderness park, um, that I've been fortunate enough to spend some time in that is similar to a national park or state park, but it is not run by the federal government or the state. It's run by the local tribal council. Um, and it was one of the first areas where that kind of land management had been practiced. And they've done an amazing job with it. But the problem is that is only, you know, few tens of thousands of acres in a much larger area where there's a lot of difficulties um, that, or a lot of difficulties are being inflicted on the populations there as a result of um, uh, all kinds of environmental difficulties that we probably don't have time to go into today, but is really a significant area of study. So when, um, when I got interested in doing something in Glacier Park, because I thought glaciers, ice, okay, I know how to deal with this. Um, I went up there and very quickly started to realize that I needed to learn a lot more about the local populations, the local indigenous communities, and, and was very fortunate, was able to meet a few folks there, and have started work on this project called the Chrysler Crisis. Chrysler Crisis, I'm going to show you a short excerpt from this. Um, it's still a work in progress, we're still developing it, uh, but um, it has the voices of some of my um, indigenous colleagues in it, as a matter of fact, they created about 70% of this. I, I had the original idea and then created about 30%. So uh, let's watch this. Modern day indigenous people are leading the way all over the world, exercising sovereignty to protect water, mountains, non-human animals, and everyone else through traditional ecological knowledge. Our numbers are small, but our influence is growing. We can disagree about specifics and we can debate legislation. But I would argue that people can learn from indigenous people on how to become one with nature again. And yeah. Change the double edged smart. Change the map when it's first. I can't change the world alone. Together we can change the course. Switch the way we've been thinking, man. Not so selfish at the source. Mother Earth is the one that's hurting. We need to let nature run its course. I said, change the double edged smart. Change the map when it's forced. I can't change the world alone. Together we can change the course. Switch the way we've been thinking. Not so selfish at the source. Mother Earth is the one that's hurting. We need to let nature run its course. Stop polluting our minds with trash. Stop polluting our air with gas. We're burning every single place we touch. Burning bridges, pillage and path. Our footprint too big to be leaving the here. Need to repair all the damage we've done. We gotta think about the crash fear, man. The science here, second to none. My people have been the result of change. Not all that change been good to us. I know change is good, but really it's not when it's only blocks to be burning stuff. Our planet suffers if we get greedy. Nobody thinks about that kind of stuff. This Selfishness turns selflessness. That's where the people need making up. We can change the world as long as we together. We can't change the earth. We can't change the weather. I can't change the work, but I can change for better. Doing things that benefit life, we have to change forever. Yeah, change the double edged sword. So, um, for any Mac Miller fans there, uh, the Shadow is definitely uh, styling a Mac Miller vibe. Um, and uh, this project is an example of what I would call co-creation. Um, MJ, who is the voice you heard at the beginning, is um, studying environmental ethics um, at the graduate level in Montana. He wants to bring those ideas back into his community in various ways. Um, Shadow, who's the rapper that you saw, runs a, a music studio um, in, in Montana and worked with his colleagues to create the entire video that you saw or the um, entire uh, rap part of the video. Um, the, um, it might have been a little hard to hear, but MJ was talking about the importance of traditional ecological knowledge, uh, the, uh, which is 
you know, a, a really uh, burgeoning field now with many people, especially and most importantly, people from indigenous communities finding ways to connect their own intuition, their own heritage, their own knowledge of practices that maybe they previously couldn't express in more in a kind of a linear scholarly way and connecting that with the um, academic research and the research by that's been done by others in this area of traditional ecological knowledge. So um, the uh, film we're working on and also will be a live performance has a large uh, TEK component that we're working on, uh, essentially led by them. And then um, Shadow uh, works a lot with dancers and unfortunately I just don't have the ability to show you all the dance footage right now, but once the film's released, it has some really um, amazing powwow dancers who uh, do this particular kind of stylized performance that we then actually with their permission, moved them into the forests. And so they uh, did these dances that are normally performed at rodeo grounds in this forest environment and by the creeks and rivers. We're gonna put them in glacier environments too. So really kind of making an artistic statement to connect these um, uh, ideas in various ways with me kind of learning the most of anybody along this whole process. Um, and uh, Shadow's song, um, uh, uh, he repeated it a couple of times, but just important to keep in mind that his song is really about this idea of change and how difficult it can be to address change um, as someone who is not necessarily a change maker, as someone who is subjected to change that maybe you didn't choose, that is affecting you in ways that you're not down with, but you have no choice. So that was, uh, that was his approach and, and mostly his words with a little bit of um, uh, contribution from me and others. So um, I want to just kind of think about where this might go in the future. And one of the things I've been trying to do as an artist interested in working with co-creation is trying to study the way some others, some experts have been working in this way. And um, there's a group at MIT called the Open Documentary Lab that have been working for a long time on making various kinds of documentary films. They're led by a, a media scholar who's interested in documentaries, but they've assembled a really interesting team. Uh, the leader is uh, William Eurekio, there's Sarah Wollison and Kate Sizyak that have created this uh, co-creation studio uh, they just recently, in the last few months, published this book called Collective Wisdom, and the subtitle is Co-Creating Media for Equity and Justice. And I don't know, it's like 300 pages. It's really rich, really deep. And the best part is it was collectively written by this whole group of people who have these really interesting approaches um, uh, to this whole idea of creating media. Now they're a little more focused on the kind of documentary media creation side of things. I'm a bit more on the kind of fine art side of things, but you know, there's a lot we can learn from what they do. And especially, and this is what I want to leave you with today. You don't have to read the whole thing, but I'll leave it up for a while. This is the thing they created called the co-creation manifesto, which is essentially, it's not even really a manifesto. I'd say it like is, is a series of guidelines uh, that we can follow as we start thinking about how creative projects, whether they be media projects or artistic projects, or I dare to venture maybe even scholarly and academic projects, can be created in a way that's not about the sole author. I think of it as the sole author syndrome. Um, that you know, if something's not created by a sole author, it doesn't have sufficient relevance or value. Or what's your percentage? Um, I realize maybe why that was the case. I'm not sure that it has to keep being the case. Um, so um, just from my own personal perspective of being a person who creates art of various kinds, I'm interested in this notion that projects don't necessarily have to originate from the singular auteur vision. You know, it, the auteur idea comes from filmmaking where you have a single auteur who's the director of everything and everybody serves that singular vision. Instead of that, Pieces can originate from relationships and deep listening and dialogue. There's really a process that one can engage in that you're making media from within communities like you saw with Shadow and heard from MJ. This is coming from them and with them rather than for them or about them. 
obviously we can reframe who gets to tell which story, who owns it and why. And of course, close to the heart of the mission of the Newkirk Center, these things can be grounded in principles of equity uh, and justice. And um, thinking, skipping forward to number seven, they're all important, but just in the interest of time, it's easy to fall into the trap of using exploitive methods when we're doing scientific research, when we're doing artistic creation, you know, when we're trying to get a paper uh, accepted, um, where there are, you know, technologies, workflows, tools, protocols that certain people have privileged access to, others do not. And so rather than kind of using these tools as a way to kind of perpetuate the existing paradigm, can we find ways that these tools, these um, uh, protocols, this workflows can become something that's more accessible to a wider range of people, um, especially this idea of multiple languages of storytelling. Um, and um, not only interpret the world as in my case as an artist, but really find ways that to whatever extent possible, our work can change it by tackling complex problems that maybe don't have easy solutions, maybe don't have any solutions, but that's not a reason for giving up. We still have to find ways to approach them, prob the problem solving by multiple points of view. So um, I'll, I'll leave this here. I think it's a, an interesting thing to think about in all kinds of contexts. It's something I'm trying to learn from. And I think it's something that um, has, has uh, the, the importance of this has really been accentuated to me by the time, short time I've spent so far working uh, with Steve and all the colleagues uh, in the Newkirk Center. So um, with that, maybe this is a good time to open it to questions, discussions. Was there anything I said that enraged you, hopefully, um, or that you'd like to support? <laughs> Great. Oh, thanks, Greg. I appreciate it. And, and yeah, you raise a really interesting question, which is, okay, who is this most beneficial for? Is it the, you know, the, the people who are um, kind of leading or sparking the process? Is it um, the, the performers, the students who might be involved? Is it um, the audience who sees it? I don't have, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. Although I would say with the work we've done um, in the Embodied Media Research Group, um, other than being a transformational experience for me, I think it's probably most beneficial to the students. You know, I think they're the ones that have really seen new ways of doing things. The students that are performers, designers, creators. Um, but we are very interested in finding ways to engage the communities more directly. We usually have very appreciative comments after the performances. People talk about how it's shown them new things or, uh, uh, shone a different light on potential concerns or problems. Um, I'd like to find ways that we can accentuate that even still further. Other questions, thoughts? Yeah. 
comments. Yes. Right, I think that's super important. Are you familiar with the drag queen named Patty Gonia? So Patty, P-A-T-T-Y, Gonia, uh, drag queen who performs environmental activism. And um, I think anything we can do to bring, uh, and is like a TikTok celebrity, so anything we can do that brings this into the culture of everyday people today that, that speaks to them in their media language, I think could be super helpful. I'd be happy to chat with you more about it. You had a question. I love it. I think that's a really great idea. And especially when he's you know, standing in front of the waterfall and we don't hear the waterfall. That feels a little bit uh, forced. That's just because we haven't actually done a sound mix for it yet. So we'll definitely do that. I think that's a really great idea. But did you say crackling of the fires? Yeah. I love that idea. I love that. I could, yeah, you could really imagine like going into a world where there's the fire and ice uh, juxtaposition. I love it. Thank you. Other thoughts? Yes. It does. Super important, and and I certainly agree. Um, and uh, my my next project, even though the prize for one isn't even barely started yet, much less finished, I really want to do a piece related to the wildfires and and all the things you just described. So yes, yeah, super important. Other yes. Wow, it's a great question. Well, I certainly, um, looking back, you know, I regret all the years I spent thinking that I had to be an auteur, that I had to be the person who came up with all the ideas and kind of, you know, was, because those were my mentors, my models were people who really took that kind of approach. Um, and in terms of, of learning from the students, I think I learn most about technology from the students because they're the ones that are kind of more engaged in the you know contemporary technology funny story not too long after I, I've only been in here um, I've only been a professor for 20 years and only been here for 20 years but um, shortly after I came to UCI um, um, we, I was teaching a, a, a course and um, there was video involved we were kind of moving the transition from analog to digital video and um, I, I came across this uh, software or this uh, online site I wanted to show the students where you could actually play videos online, which was, I thought, this revolutionary thing. Um, 
And and I I uh, said you know to myself I'll I'll have to kind of you know put this in the mix. And um, so then I talked to the students and I said you know are any of you doing any online video? And like you know it was in a lecture hall of like sixty people and about thirty hands went up. I thought oh maybe they know something. And so so I said well. Um, so, so what kinds of uh, programs are you using? And they kind of looked at me like, programs? They said, oh, we're on YouTube. And I said, YouTube, would you please spell that for the students who have never heard of this? Because I'd never heard of YouTube. It'd only been out like about two months, right? And, and, and they said, oh, YouTube. And I said, well, come on up and demonstrate it. And so they went online to the primitive computer in the lecture hall and showed a very early version of YouTube. And I was frantically kind of like taking mental notes, trying to make sure I remembered all this. So. You know, I don't always fake it, but that I was really embarrassed that I didn't know about this thing. But anyway, long story short, I, I think the students are the ones that are really engaging with the technology. The digital natives that we have today as in our undergrad populations are people for whom this creation of visual media is just a birthright. It's something they started with when they were in the in utero and they've continued it ever since. And, you know, it it's really I think it's it's a it's a sea change in the way people experience the world. And so, you know, I'm always interested in, in learning from them in that regard. Thanks for the question. You had a question at the back there, sir. I think that could definitely be present, be incorporated, and I think the way you've introduced it is is a really good um, uh, is a nice match with the way we are trying to engage with scientific inquiry as part of our artistic inquiry. This notion that, um, well, great, we can solve the problem with the microbes ingesting the plastics, but then what? Do they emit? And then does that just move, you know, an oceans problem into the atmosphere? And anyway, aren't the oceans and atmospheres really connected? So um, I think the way I would try to address that kind of a specific technical solution is just to try to kind of point more specifically at things like unintended consequences. And from the artistic perspective, not so much try to communicate this as a solution that might be introduced as at a scientific conference, but really kind of try to problematize the space a bit to try to introduce some of the things we might not have thought about. Yeah. So, mm -hmm.
it's a, uh, yeah, I understand the concept, I think. I understand the question. I, and I do feel like maybe some of the answers are up here. This notion that perhaps there is not one specific canonical view of history, that perhaps you know, each researcher, um, each culture, um, each individual uh, community group may have a different perspective on this. And so by bringing in the multiple perspectives, that's a way that when I say problematize, I mean not so much engage with the solution or the definitive story about how something was or will be, but really more to be in a process of inquiry. Michael. Mm -hmm. Good point. I, I would just make sure that we also include that word auteur in there. So I think they're trying to say a singular auteur vision, auteur meaning the individual through, wh through whom every decision gets made or ratified. Yeah, and, and you know, if you, th if you think of um, projects originating from relationships, then those are relationships between entity and entity. Maybe a singular vision here, a singular vision here, and a singular vision here can then engage in a relationship. So you're bringing up a good point. You know, things that are created by committees are not always necessarily the most effective way to go, especially, you know, documents, et cetera. But um, I, I'm introducing this um, almost more as an alternative point of view that's hopefully thought provoking as opposed to like the final solution. Oh, I think that's my cue. Um, we're almost at five o'clock. And um, so I think we probably need to vacate the room at some point. I'm happy to stick around and chat. This has been so inspiring and thanks so much everybody for being here. Um, and uh, thank you to the Newkirk Center. My information's here if you wanna reach out at some point. Thanks everybody.